Morning, Roy. Everybody and good good evening to all from India and good morning to everybody from Paraguay and North America and um, this is a joint webinar between the national societies of Paraguay and India and my co-conveners are Lowell Kavnik and Victor Kanata. So let me introduce uh, Professor Lowell Kavnik. He's a current vice president of the International Union of Lobology. He's the past president of the American Venus Forum and associate editor of the journal Globology and of course, of Lebo Friend and a friend too. And Lowell, can, would you introduce Victor for us? Is that I'd be it? happy to. Thank you, thank you. Please go ahead. So, so good days, ladies and gentlemen. And before we commence, I'd like to introduce the conveners. Professor Dr. Victor Kanata is the past president of the Paraguayan Society of Phobology and Lymphology, vice president of the UIP, professor of surgery and anatomy at the Universidad Nacional de Asuncion, Paraguay. And lastly, Dr. Malay Patel is the founding president of Venus Association of India, the assistant general secretary of the International Union of Phobology, and a plebo friend and friend. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that takes us now to the next step of the program. And may I have the panelists, uh, are, do we have the panelists here? Uh, yes, we have Roy and Rahul and can we have uh, Heidi or uh, Chantal to start the proceedings, introduce, of course, the first speaker has been introduced uh, by uh, Dr. Kadnik. So that doesn't uh, require an introduction, but uh, uh, Roy, can you introduce uh, Harry Bedi from, from India? And then we have uh, leave, give the floor to Victor. Professor Harinder Singh Bedi is the next incoming president of the Venus Association of India. He is a trained cardiovascular surgeon and a quite one famous at that quite a famous one at that, because he was the head of department of Christian Medical College in Ludhiana, one of the premier medical colleges of India. Welcome, Dr. Harinder Bedi. Thank, Thank you. you. And can we, can I now ask, uh, you know, Chantal or Stella to please, uh, uh, you know, it's a ladies, so let the ladies allow Victor to start his talk. Shantan. You want me to, to introduce? Uh, yeah, you know, you can, you, can, you, can, you, you can probably introduce also in Spanish, you know, because... Ah, okay, in Spanish. Okay, el profesor Canata está, eh, nos va a dar una charla. Él es past president de la Sociedad de Flebología Paraguaya, eh, también profesor en la Universidad Nacional de Asunción. En este momento también está eh, llevando a cargo eh, un importante papel en la Unión Internacional de Flebología eh, como vicepresidente representándonos en América Latina. Y bueno, me parece que eh, va a ser muy interesante la charla de Clax que nos va a presentar ahora. Thank you. Thank you. We could pick up some words from, because some, some Spanish, yeah, words are, are common. So please, <laughs> Professor uh, Kanata, please, uh, you, the stage is yours. Or the, okay, the, cy the cyber arena is yours. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I will start my uh, sharing my screen. The first thing that I wanted to say is that I would like just to uh, remember that joining societies are working together and we can do a blast always when we do together things. Uh, Malai uh, and Dr. Roy Burgis, Dr. Uh, Chantal, Dr. Cáceres, uh, Dr. Robert Cagnick, thank you very much just to let me express myself. I would just, just to show my expertise in one area that we start working on it, that is CLAX, um, how we are doing it and what we are working and what we expect for the future in this new kind of treatment in the phlebology field. I will start sharing my screen. Uh, let me 
do you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Sir, we can. Yeah. Okay, one minute. Okay, <clears throat> thanks to the Indian Society of Phlebology as well as the Paraguayan Society of Phlebology for this uh, excellent webinar and all my friends that are, they are looking at this excellent um, way of meeting. CLAC is the new way of treatment, it is the acronym's letter of cryolaser and cryosclerotherapy and it's coming to change all the world in phlebology since we have that new kind of treatment right now. There is no conflict of interest. Um, and it's, uh, from my point of view, is the new kind of treatment and we will change the way that we are treating the vein disease, especially the aesthetic way of treatment that will be at the laser plus sclerotherapy, showing that, that the improvement after the two treatments are much better for our patients. To, just to remind what is going on already, the class is the acronym of cryolaser and cryosclerotherapy, and together is a new kind of treatment. The treat laser treatment is done under the um, frozen air, which helps with the patient with the pain as well as improving the effect of the laser beam. Then we just shut the sclerotherapy with glycol 75% and no compression is applied. Um, how are the steps that we do when we have that kind of treatment? Uh, we have, um, There are people who use 50% glycos, there are people who use 75 glycos, 0.25 polydocanol or plus the help of 1064 NDJ laser and the Fredo machine who give it the cooler air just to avoid the pain when the laser treatment is done and also the help with the vein viewer. All that kind of step showing us everything and give us enough strength to just to go through the, that kind of treatment. Um, what are the technical requirements? We are talking about uh, a lot of stuff, but this is the future of phlebology. You need a phlebo suite, you need augmented reality, you need the ND Jack 1064, a Fredo frozen machine, as well as your sclerotherapy technique. There is something that we address also when we have the master of this kind of technique that is Dr. Katsuo Miyaki. As you are more than aware, this is the old flavo suit. The old flavo suit is something that we have to change. You see the stool, you see um, 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 some improvised light in the middle, of, in the middle of, of your office, and this is something that we have to change it. The way of the flavo suit that we have to have is uh, everything in our staff, or a very good table, a very good light, or laser um, at the side, or machines working with us, we know that it's just a little bit uh, expensive, but when we are treating our patient, the patient wants to have very good results and your results are coming by the equipment that you have. You have to also understand the venous disease. You have to know anatomy, physiology, your tools, history, as well as ultrasound. We are working in ultrasound right now, trying to improve the way that we are doing and trying to just uh, embrace everything. And then, the first step that you have to remember is the photo documentation. This is the first step. You have to label everything, have a very set of pictures before uh, your treatment, between 50 to 100 uh, uh, pictures that you must take. As you see over here, this is a lady who was labeled 19106. Uh, we are trying to uh, see the vein, where is the area that failed, also the small areas that we we have, and this is the way that we are working in, in, in CLAX. You have to take all the pictures and then show them before and after to the patient. This is the key for that treatment. Also, you must have that kind of neat new machine that we call in the vein viewer. The vein viewer is a machine who superimpose data or image directly to the real object or environment making easier for people to learn information, make decisions, and have the task done without trouble. The vein viewer works by increasing the contrast of vein by digitally imaging a continuous spot 
over the skin using an infrared camera enhancing the acquired image and then projected to the skin at the same spot, showing everything much better, the patient love and also the physician. This is the way that we have and the, the way that we see a leg in our patient right now. You see all things that we are not able to see under the naked eye. You will be able to see after you apply the vein view. It works in two kind of way. When you are moving one side to the other, you will be able to just to have a better view of everything. The, as I said before, photo documentation is mandatory in our favorite aesthetic patient as well in clocks. What are the steps that we use in clocks? Augmented reality visualization of the feeder veins, application of transdermal laser to the feeder veins, overlying telangiectasis 2, injection of all sclerosis agent, and we cool down the temperature with the Fredo machine just to make sure that the patient doesn't feel the laser when we apply it. This is an, something that we saw at the office. You might see two or three veins that they are coming and there are feeder veins. We just take pictures of this, make sure that the patient saw it before and after to see the results and the patient are very happy after this. Um, this is some way that we are working right now. As you might see a, a small feeder vein, trying to see it. Look how beautiful we are able just to identify the way that the, the vein are um, coming to the skin. And the other part that we have is the laser vein treatment. The NDX 1064 is uh, just the easy way to treatment of varicose veins by selective absorption of light with heating the modeling, giving some irreversible damage of the basal wall. I would like just to show you how do we work because this is very good. What is the way, what is the length, what is the fluency on the pulse wipe that we use is very nice and we have to know it because sometimes we are not, we are trying just to cook the vein a little bit, not to get a burn on the skin. Um, as you might see, we just shut one or two times um, we use the Fredo to cool down the skin. Then we keep shutting and until we know that all the treatment is done. This is part of the key of the treatment. Just not to give too much energy, just that the energy is between 60 to 70 joules with six millimeter spot size with 15 millimeters of pulse wipe. This is another treatment. I will just to see that. Look, we are moving just one spot to the other. We are not overlapping shots. And then you are able to see how after we shut the laser, you have a little bit of shrink of the vein after we treat them. And the vein viewer also helping you trying to see the vein. This is in the other modality. You see, we are shutting one post, one more, one. We keep moving and you see this is part of the result. I will like just to show you. You shut that before and then one minute after we give just a little bit of, of energy you will see that area, that, that is the area, and this is the key that for that kind of treatment. You have to just go through with the moving your laser beam and your Fredo machine all over through the vein, trying just to make a, a good treatment, not too much, just to cook the vein. The treatment of a varicose vein by the injection of one irritant that causes inflammation, we call them Sclerotherapy. Um, Dr. Miyake is using 75% of glucose. Dr. Dadas in India is using glycose 50%, and I use in Paraguay uh, polydocanol 0.25%. We have very good results, and this is one way. That shot is with, you see, this is glycose 75%, and you are seeing after we do the cooking with the laser, how we 
just give enough amount of glycose just to make the bean disappear. And this is my treatment. We are just giving after the laser one shot of STS or polydocanol to make sure that the vein disappear. Just to remember and again what we are doing it and the results. Then you may see at the right side you see with glycose and in the left side you will see with polydocanol. We just shut the laser in this patient. Now we are trying to just move a little bit and give a small amount of or sclerotherapy agent. You see how are beautiful the results. The vein disappear immediately. Just small tiny amounts of S of polydocanol we give it to us that result. The same stuff we have for the right, but this is just a little bit difficult different, this is glycose. We give a little bit more when we use glycose. The shot is just a little bit longer and we just saw how the vein is vanishing after the treatment. Do you see? It's beautiful. You can see everything and this is the help that you can get with the vein viewer. The treatment can be seen and the results are very good. If you turn down the light, also you will be able to have the same result that you see from before. You see, this is the sclerotherapy after I cook the vein with the laser. I've been just giving a small tiny amount of polydocanol, 0.25% as a foam with the Mestesari technique, and you will be able to see the results. Just to remind how is and what is the history of the clocks. You saw the vein with the vein viewer, you cook the vein with the laser, you saw that you have the collapsed vein after the treatment, and then you inject the, your sclerotherapy agent. Dr. Miyake saying that 75% of glucose is the best. Dr. Dadas in India said, I got very good results, 50% of glucose and Dr. Kanata in Paraguay is saying that I have very good result also with polydocanol 0.25%. Just to remember and again, the four stages. See the vein with the vein viewer, cook the vein with the laser, use, check that you have the collapsed vein, and then you sh give the, the last shot of sclerotherapy. This is just to remember because we are doing just a, a webinar between India and Paraguay was by Dr. Dadas in India. This is, this is part of his work. He's doing very nice. He's cooking the vein, the same that I did from before. Then after he's cooking the vein, he will inject the 0.50% of glycose. You see, you give a long shot when you use glycose, just a little bit different than when I used to, to use my uh, polydocanol in my country. See the results you see the before and after, and the results are very good. Before and after, before and after. What are the peers for the treatment? Laser settings are spot six millimeters, fluence six to 60 to 70 joules. The pulse white has to be 10 to 15, and you have to use the frozen machine, the Frido. Cosmetic patients are always different than our patient. You have to tell the patient always the truth. What I mean with that? You have to take the, your picture and then showing them before and after very frequently seeing that the, your treatment is improving the leg of the patient. You have to tell them the pain will disappear after two, three treatments, after one week, after two weeks. This is the expectation of your patient. You remember that they want to see your results. They want to see that they are doing better and they will keep coming back if they saw that you are telling them the truth. Show the result as soon as you can. You have to have in your office the best equipment, very large uh, screen TVs, an improvement of the patient in my office after the first treatment is more than 50%. 
in after two or three class treatment, you will have more than 80%. And 80% will be um, the improvement after the third treatment. For the documentation, from my pure point of view, is the key. You have to just take pictures and just store it. This is a big trouble sometimes, but um, if you have um, um, a large um, uh, computer in your office, you will be able to do it without big trouble. This is the result before and after. I just, when, when we saw the patient at, at the office, when we shot the laser, when we just shot two or three areas, and then after the sclerotherapy, the results are very good. The vein disappear, and you are seeing the fourth stage of the CLAX treatment. The results are very good. The patients are very happy, and you will see. This is another one, another uh, area in the back of the vein, and we just start taking the first picture. Then we just start cooking the vein with the laser a little bit. Then the second one after the sclerotherapy, and then one week after the treatment, the vein disappear, and the results are very good. You must remember that kind of stuff. You will be able to see it and show to your patient in your office in large screen TV. They are amazing. The people are very happy, and they saw the results. This is just to remember before and after. One more picture before and after. One more before and after. Um, the system work in all the aesthetic patient and have to be mastered. And this is our idea right now. We are trying to work together, trying to have uh, our paperwork being done, set it up the settings, trying to improve the way that we communicate and then have the best for our patient. This is something that I want to remember. This is Stan. Stan is the uh, dinosaur in the back of the Google um, um, in, in California. If you remember, this is, the Stan is a dinosaur surrounded by flamingos. The dinosaur has 3,000 years already and flamingos too. If you might see the flamingos evolve and they were able to just to go through all the troubles and all the problems. And this is the way that we have, we have to have right now. We have to find out the will to evolve. We have to go through and I just to um, remind that the residency is the way that we will be able to go through. This is uh, the idea after showing that picture of Stan. This is from my office. All my nurses and everybody is, are very happy. We are working in the, in, in the COVID mode and we are doing very nice and very well. Um, thank you very much for everything. I am ready to take questions or give uh, an answer regarding about this. Um, Muchas gracias a todos y eh, espero que les haya gustado la presentación. I will stop sharing my screen. I hope it was okay. You have everything uh, back, my life. You have for you and also low. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, we can have the panelists come in and. Uh, have a short discussion or do we want to have the second talk and have all the discussion with together? What's the panelists say? What does... Uh... Malay, I believe that uh, as usual, uh, let's finish the second lecture also. Then we'll have okay. some common questions. Of course, okay. Victor has been excellent as usual. Okay. So let's, let's go with the second talk then. Harinder, Harinder? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just uh, about yeah. to start my screen sharing. Vishal, I seem to have uh, not able to get the screen. Okay. 
Okay, Malay, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, we can see the screen too. Okay. Well, hello everyone. I'll be talking to you about different laser wavelengths, specifically or only in relation to truncal veins, not in relation to any other lesions. A very warm Buenos Dias to everyone. I have no disclosures except for one. And that is a fascination with lasers for more than 20 years. The very first laser that I used in the medical field was in 1994. And this was a transmyocardial laser for the heart. And uh, I was lucky to be the first in Asia to have used it. Now this laser was a carbon dioxide laser. The wattage is 1000 watts. While the laser for us today is about 10 watts. So you can imagine the strength of this laser. And it, it actually, if you, it hits your hand, it, in one of my colleagues got a through and through hole. It's a very, very strong laser. So very warm greetings from my state of Punjab in India, which is a deeply religious and a very vigorous state, my faculty. And uh, let's get on to this topic that is endovenous laser ablation. This was first described in 1999 and in a very short time has become the standard of care for varicose veins. Sir, excuse me. Uh, sir, I can see there are two boxes over this PPT. Okay, better. Uh, it's going, it's, yeah, it's, it's better now, okay. but not completely, but little better now. I don't see any boxes here. Is it yeah. better now? Shall I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Yeah. So therapy is based on a very simple um, uh, principle of photothermal lysis. That is uh, damage to the vein by heat therapy. So laser light heats the target tissue, causes irreversible, hopefully irreversible, thermal injury. And we'll be talking a little bit uh, about that. The injury will depend on the laser wavelength and the absorption of the tissues, which are called the chromophores. Chromophore is the tissue which absorbs the uh, laser energy. And that is the target that we have. And I'll be talking to you about that. Now, basically the uh, wavelengths that we have today or which started us was 810 nanometers. And we progressed to 940, 980, 1064, 1470, and now the 1940 is also available for clinical practice. Now, how does the laser work? Where does the heat go? Uh, there are various theories, but most importantly, there is a direct energy absorption by the water content of the vein wall. And this is about for the latest uh, wavelengths. It also creates steam bubbles, which travel a short distance. It can heat the blood the previous wavelengths heated the hemoglobin in the blood, which was not very good. And the new ones heat the water and there is conduction of heat. So these are the methods by which the laser works. There are various companies. The common ones are angiodynamics from USA and the lasertronics from Poland and the serialness of the biolytic from um, Germany. I have used all three. I believe there are a few others which I have not used. The Leonardo, which uh, is a portable one, very small one, which you can see on the left. And another one over here, it is touted as being uh, by wavelengths, but I don't think that is much of an advantage. So a little bit, uh, I, I had to read up a little bit about the physics of lasers. And uh, I, I, in fact, um, was fortunate enough to write a book chapter in one of these books from Springer. And, but I needed the help of my son, that's the second author, who's a scientist. So basically to make it very simple, our all light is basically electromagnetic pulse. So that's a simple bulb. And that's the quiggly things are um, the light, which is electromagnetic. You can see you know, all light has ups and downs, which are called troughs, crest and trough. And the distance between two crest is known as wavelength. So that's simple enough. The unit is nanometer, which is a billionth of a meter. And visible light ranges from 400 to 800 nanometers. So that you can see 
in the total spectrum of light and we human beings can see a tiny 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 spectrum which is just 400 to 800 nanometers and as the wavelength increases you can see the distance between the crest and the troughs increases so these are the various wavelengths which are used in laser therapy and the commonest is the diode you can see over here which is 9800 onwards up to 1940 a little bit about how light is uh, emitted. There is spontaneous emission in nature. Most atoms are very lazy. So when they get excited, they want to come back to their original state and emit light, which is spontaneous emission. And when you, we artificially enhance it, that is called stimulated emission or laser. So basic laser depends on energy source, a gain medium, and two mirrors which reflect the light. And finally, there is an avalanche of coherent light which is thrown onto uh, the tissue that we want to heat. And the gain medium is the most important. And for us, the gain medium is mostly a diode, a semiconductor or a diode. Mm -hmm. So that's the types of laser. We are concerned uh, with the diode laser over here. There are other lasers like carbon dioxide, which I had used in 1994 for the heart, and more lasers which are used in industry for cutting purposes. So that's laser, uh, that's the acronym. It's light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation. So it is unnatural, it is created by us and it relies on the transformation of luminous energy into heat. And that's and the light is uh, very specific in that it is monochromatic, there's only one wavelength. In fact, you can uh, tailor make it to 1940 and not 1941, it is so accurate it is coherent and it is collimated. That is, it goes straight. And that is the strength of this laser. It is not scattered. And uh, so what happens when this interacts with living tissue? Let's see. So that is our aim. So at lower temperatures, there is warming. At slightly higher temperatures, there is blanching, puckering. And at 100 degrees centigrade, there is vaporization. This is a uh, scene from a very famous movie, Resident Evil. It shows how laser can through human beings if it is of the strong enough. And since it is very hot, it actually cauterizes. So there will be no bleeding. So tissue is irreversibly injured. If the temperature is more than 75 degrees, uh, 75 centigrade for one second or 70 centigrade for 10 seconds. So both function the distance, the time, and the power, both are important. We did an experiment, and probably for the first time that it was done in a human vein, and we uh, tested it outside the body. This was a spare sort of human vein. And you can see, when you apply heat inside the vein, the whole vein actually gets cooked. So there is heat, the vein shrinks, and not only shrinks, it actually shrinks in diameter and also in length. There you can see. And that is very important that reason is that supposing it shrinks, it can pull up a nerve below the knee or at the back of the knee and that can damage the nerve even if it is not damaged by heat. Just shrinkage can damage the surrounding tissues. So that is something we have to keep in mind. And this was a very good study and then we studied it microscopically and published it and it showed basically that there is a pan uh, lumen uh, damage to the vein. So the greater the degree of absorption, the greater the degree of transformation of heat. So that is where the science of the laser comes in. And the main light absorbing or the heat absorbing component of the tissue is called the chromophore. And it can be hemoglobin of the blood. It can be melanin. Brown people have more melanin and it can be water. So, so the, these are the laser parameters. So you can select, you can create a laser of a specific wavelength other parameters which are in your hand are pulse duration, energy fluence, and they can be altered according to you. The wavelength is the most important thing which is fixed in the machine and the effect depends on the wavelength of the light. Since the laser light is monochromatic and it has a very narrow bandwidth, so we can target the chromophore very specifically. It is like tailor designing, like a designer wavelength. And the, the lasers we used mostly in truncal veins are diode lasers. That's a little bit too uh, technical. I'll skip through that. And 
see the lasers have otherwise been used in industry and if you've seen these two movies there are iconic movies and uh, they show that the laser is so strong that it can damage it can break buildings and it can even cut through metal in this case it is cutting through gold so uh, that's the uh, gold that's the james bond movie gold finger and that's actually is possible so lasers as i said you can have two types of lasers at present hemoglobin specific laser wavelength which is the lesser shorter wavelengths and the water specific so the shorter wavelengths are 810 to 980 and the newer ones are the higher wavelengths and what we want is we don't want to attack the blood blood is moving it is dynamic chromophore and that will take away the heat and it will in fact cause more of a problems aim is to target the vein wall and that is the practical application is that we empty the vein by lifting the leg and also by giving tumor center anesthesia so this is the most important slide to understand at the bottom the x axis is the wavelength y axis is the absorption so the lower wavelengths will target the hemoglobin which we don't want and the higher wavelengths will target the uh, water that is blue and the higher you go the more absorption of water which is what is required so 1470 nanometers is 400 times more absorption into water than 810 and 40 times more than 980 while the one higher than this that is 1940 is 40 times uh, stronger than 1470 so these are the three types that you can see they are being studied and it's a big science there is a very good institute uh, in netherlands which has done a large number of experiments and here you can see as the power increases the temperature goes up which is very understandable what is more important is as the wavelength increases you can see over here the absorption coefficient goes up that is with the higher wavelength it is better absorbed so you can reduce the power and also you can see that the scattering coefficient reduces with the higher wavelengths i'll just magnify this you can see over here as the wavelength goes up the absorption into the water increases so that is very very important and as i said the most important method for the damage of the vein is direct transfer of the heat energy so that is why you have to empty the vein of blood as much as possible so 1470 i already told you has 40 times higher absorption coefficient as the laser is monochromatic you can select or create a laser which will target a chromophore that is water water is targeted both in the collagen of the vein wall and also in the blood because most uh, the commonest part of the blood is actually water so okay so now we have shown that we can create different wavelengths so does it actually uh, transform to better results let us see so there are number of uh, papers on this and all have shown that with a higher wavelength results are the same as far as closure of the vein but pain and ecchymosis are much less with a higher wavelength and damage to the unnecessary damage to surrounding tissue is also reduced thrombus formation you don't want is lesser with the higher wavelength so the power we used is generally in the uh, higher wavelengths is about 8 to 10 watts for the great saphenous vein that gives us 80 joules per centimeter and we move the fiber 1 centimeter after 10 seconds which gives us in 10 seconds gives us 80 joules and similarly for the short saphenous it can be 7 watts and for perforators it is 4 watts so you can actually dial down in the machine the wattage besides watts there are a few other um, measures or indices that one should know about they're not very easy to understand but uh, we should know about it one is the linear endovenous energy density or the lead it is the heat energy in joules divided by centimeters but since the vein can be bigger then it is better to divide to have it as uh, the the energy divided by the centimeter square so that in a larger vein you know and that is called a endovenous fluence equivalent so i think we should just know about this there are little difficult to calculate for every patient but sometimes uh, the machine does the calculation for you and if you are doing a study it is important to document this okay we are stuck here let's see okay and there is still no standard uh, established 
which gives us a recommendation on how much energy, how much lead, but these are some rough parameters which you can see over here. And we don't, well, uh, I'll be frank uh, with you, I hardly ever look at those parameters unless we are doing planning a study. So published studies have all documented excellent results, even with the older hemoglobin specific lasers. And with the newer ones, the results are as good, except that you have lesser amount of pain and echinosis. Now this is one of the landmark papers, and I'm happy and honored that Dr. Lowell Kavnik is here. This is his paper. And he compared the 980 with the uh, 810, and he was actually the first one probably, please correct me if I'm wrong, who gave a scoring system for bruising. So here you have different scoring bar, zero, two, and up to five, uh, how to score the bruising. And he was able to show and publish in the Journal of Vascular Surgery that the lower, higher wavelength is equally effective, but causes lesser bruising and lesser pain. And this has been duplicated by so many other studies which have shown a very similar thing that higher uh, wavelength translates to lesser pain, lesser echimosis. This is what is important now because the patient and we also want, besides good results, we want that the uh, patient should not have pain or least pain. Now, we must also know about one paper which did not agree with this, and this is a very recent paper late last year, and that uh, did a uh, 28. They, picked out 28 RCTs with a total of 2,829 great saphenous veins. And they said in their paper that the wavelength does not matter. And But this immediately this paper was pounced upon, in fact, in the same journal by Mark Whiteley and others, and who punched up quite a number of holes. And I would agree with that, that this paper was not really totally true. And in fact, he used the word G-I-G-O, that is garbage in and garbage out. So he said the the parameters used and so many things were not of international standards and this paper was dismissed by a number of people but we should be aware of this paper so at the same while we are talking about wavelengths which are important we should also know uh, okay sorry all wavelengths will cause an obliteration of the vein but longer wavelength has lesser pain lesser painkillers lesser echinosis so that is important nowadays but also we must know that there are other things that is the laser power use, the lead, the fluence, the pullback velocity, the type of fiber. There are like three, four good fibers, different fibers available to us now, which we have all used. And the same uh, group from Netherlands also showed a very basic uh, good result that as the wavelength increases, the wall temperature goes up and which is uh, documented and very understandable. And with the higher wavelengths, incidence of complications, incidence of perforations are much less. So the focus is back on the quality of life. So, and not just on the uh, obliteration of the vein, which should be in the high 90s with both the wavelengths. So that is what our future research is going into, increasing the wavelength up to a limit, but then also working on other things which will reduce your complication rate. And it is not just um, academics, it's also big money involved, like um, uh, if they all patented uh, designs and you can see over here, there was a judgment against one of them, uh, which had a huge amount of money involved. So what is the future? I've told you about the wavelengths, how we went from 810 to 1940. So there's more to it. I don't think personally that going up on the wavelength, it will increase the water efficiency, water absorption a little bit more but that may not actually translate to much better results. So we should now focus on things like the fiber tip, the volume of blood, the vein diameter, the power use, and the pull block velocity. So these are some of the newer fibers. Angiodynamics has the never, never touch gold tip, while Biolytic has the radial fiber. Both of them have shown better results than the bare tip fibers. So the future, uh, like this is what we want. This is uh, just to give you a small background. This is a village in my city, in my state, where they have these Olympics. This is a distant cousin of mine. You can see he's riding these two horses so comfortably. And that is the aim we have. That one, consistent, reliable results. That is one horse. And second is patient comfort. So both things are equally important to us. So to conclude, advances in laser technology, are going, still going on. They're going, aiming for after 1940, 2000 nanometers, but I don't think that will be of much help. 
we must we have probably reached the zenith of laser wavelengths and we have to look at these other things that uh, i have mentioned over here and it's not very far off that in the near future maybe next year i'll present this that we can you know ablate away without even touching the uh, the patient so thank you muchas gracias to all of you you've been a good audience and i think both of us are very thank you very much i'll stop sharing victor please you need to unmute yourself because yes i i am doing yes yeah okay. uh, was an excellent representation dr betty thank you very much i would just to address to these or three beautiful ladies that we have from paraguay dr chantara Aguero wagner um dr heidi caceres and dr estela ferreira dr chantara Aguero wagner was a past president of the paraguayan society of Rebology, and uh, she is um a uh, very good and renowned phrenologist in Paraguay, and she will just give us a, a, a question in, in a few minutes. And then the second one, Chantal, is Dr. Heidi Cáceres um, from, uh, the, from Paraguay too. She is working in the first chair of surgery in Paraguay in the National University as a phrenologist too. And the third one is Dr. Estela Ferreira. Dr. Estela Ferreira is a phrenologist also from uh, Paraguay, she is working in Encarnacion. She is uh, working like 300 kilometers from Asuncion. Um, she is a well-known phlebologist also over there. Chantal, um, the, we would like to know your remarks and what do you think are your questions? Thank you very much for being here and sharing your expertise with us. Yes, uh, thank you for the honor to be here. Uh, it's very interesting things to mention, and I would like to talk first about clacks. I think the synergy of this technique made it, made it very successfully, and uh, of course, uh, it's expensive in our country in one way, and it's good to know that we can use polydocanol too, in your experience, Dr. Kanata, because that's the most common uh, sclerosan in our country. Uh, also, I want to know if you uh, can mention the use of uh, ultrasound instead of the main viewer, because I know sometimes you can use a uh, 10, 12 megahertz ultrasound, and probably uh, uh, that is more if you already have it. Uh, you don't need to uh, buy uh, the main viewer in that case. And also, if you can mention the biggest vein, the diameter that you use and you treat before. Uh, and for Dr. Betty, I think the, the wavelengths are, of course, improving our, our uh, technique and the laser is, is uh, the gold standard in the uh, treatment of veins. And I think the, the damage was very uh, good to, to, to decrease with the less energy uh, in the vein wall. And I, I would like to know if you uh, uh, know, uh, the, if you can mention in your experience the um, uh, adverse effect, uh, the way you manage them, if you use some prophylaxis and uh, for this patient using the wavelength you are familiar with, and also, I know Dr. Katnik mentioned uh, the tips, the jacket tips, the bear tips. I, I, I know he knows a lot about all these different kind of uh, uh, techniques and, and instruments if he want to do some remark about it. But I don't know if it's too long, <laughs> too many questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So do you want me to start or Dr. Kanata, you will start? You might start, well, no problem, Harinder, no trouble. Dr. Bedi, you might start. Okay, thank you, Chantal, for uh, your question regarding uh, the fibers. Of course, now we have all uh, graduated from the bare fiber and we have had problems. In fact, I personally had a perforation in a very thin patient in spite of using uh, large amount of tumorcent and uh, uh, the newer one the radial fiber is the one most commonly used but there are other fibers also in the pipeline they are jacketed they are ceramic coated and they're gold fibers also 
So I would like to, you know, hear the opinion of the others also regarding this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chantal, you was asking regarding about if I use the uh, 10, 12 uh, megahertz sonogram machine. The point is like this. Um, the, the equipment for the clock is Bain Viewer, Fredo, 1064, and Glycos. But you cannot replace the Bain Viewer. Why? If you see the videos, that when I show how it's working, how it's cooking the vein, and how it's shrinking the vein after the laser treatment. This is the idea to have the vein viewer at the same time working with you. You cannot have that stuff with the, with the ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound. Why? Because the ultrasound will just show with the part of the vein, you have, you have to enhance a lot the amount of gel that you're using over the skin and you will never be able to cook the vein. That is one of the reasons you're not able, but you can see feeder veins very good with that kind of ultrasound, okay? Um, there is another question regarding about if um, we can use or not polydocanol. I've been trying to use polydocanol. I have very good results. And I think we can change the view that Dr. Miyaki think regarding about, we can just only use glycose. I can, uh, from my point of view, we can use um, uh, polydocanol without big trouble. But the big things for us after the laser treatment and after the CLEX treatment is that you don't need to use compression. And this is a big trouble. We are right now in Asuncion 4200 42 degrees Celsius in temperature. It's very hot. Nobody wants to use anything over their legs. Thank you for your question, Dr. Chantal. Thank you. I open the, to the panel, Malai, if you have something, you might, or Lowell, that he yeah. is always has okay. something in her mouth. Yeah, Victor, I, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, Raul, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Victor, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, do you know of any study which is uh, comparing uh, the Clark's procedure with uh, plain dilute sclerotherapy? The point is like this, uh, Robo. Uh, the, the first study are coming from Dr. Miyaki. Just use 75% glycose and all the stuff that I show you. Now we are start having comparison. We will just set it up numbers in the near future, maybe in six months, we will have a lot of patients already done, and then we will show you the difference. There is no publication at that point because yeah. the CLAX technique is just coming out. It's coming yeah. from South America, and we don't have the final result yet. So, you see, we have been using CLAX from why I asked you this question is because I've been doing cosmetic varicose veins from nearly 10 years. And, uh, you know, we started using CLAX around two years back, so we've done around 200 patients now. And we have used 75% extras, 50% extras, 0.1 to, you know, polydocanol, STD. And we observed uh, some findings, which I like to share. One is there are different types of uh, veins which are there. So you cannot combine, uh, this is my, my thinking, all C1 varicose veins into one grade. So if you, you know, we are trying to classify them into our, our clinic now. So we are going to come up with a publication in a few months that uh, C1 varicose veins needs to be further classified because there are some veins which are totally out of the skin. There are some veins which are, you know, we like a spider. There are some veins which are straight. Some veins are, some veins are very superficial. Some veins are very deep. So you, all, them, all of them, they need a different treatment. So they cannot be just put in into one uh, procedure because they don't respond. Second is if the vein is very, very thin, then you may have to use a 30 gauge needle or 32 gauge needle then injecting a dextrose through that needle is very difficult. So uh, what I do is then I use uh, a diluted polydocanol or a diluted STD because that gives you uh, very easy to inject and it is uh, inside. And I also observed that, you know, as, because you're doing without local anesthesia. So mm -hmm. STD and polydocanol are very different. So STD, as soon as it comes out of the vein, the patient has a pain. If the STD goes inside the vein, the patient does not get any pain. So it's a very uh, good, as compared to the polydocanol, when you inject a very dilute STD, one, you know that you're inside the vein. You also know because the vein gets into spasm, but also because of the pain. And you can also inject it through 30 gauge, 32 gauge needle. So if the veins are very thin, C1, so I use 
laser with sclerosant and if the vein is okay is slightly bigger then you can use uh, you know 26 gauge 27 gauge needle with the dextrose this is one observation i found you know is very useful and you know i also want to say that we get really very very good results without doing the clocks also so you know before that so i can show you hundred of pictures before after before after and i can put in clocks at the bottom and you will not be able to differentiate uh, i tell you but yes uh, uh, i feel what in my practice little practice is i feel that clocks give you much more robust results as compared to if you just keep injecting the sclerosin plane you will get slightly more pigmentation you will get less pigmentation with clocks and all because you use less less sclerosin and i feel that you'll have to wait less in getting the better results so i think a, a comparative study is very very important uh, to be shown and published thank you thank you rabul victor yeah uh, what's uh, actually uh, the, the the point of of uh, of rabul i think from my point of view is just like this um, i'm i'm not using uh, 75% uh, glycos i know that will be it's very difficult to go through because it's a very thick uh, 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 solution but uh, i have very good result with everything it depends on you your patient and whatever you have already read to decide what technique you will use malai it's up to you any any questions from stella or heidi and or uh, about any discussion point malai uh, dr lovell and dr heidi yeah no yeah i'm 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 just going to come to that because i i need uh, dr Havnik to make uh, some uh, comments uh, we we are all waiting for him too well, thank you very much um, i enjoyed both lectures and i think they were were spot on um, the first one i will talk to is, is dr kanada and rahul I, I really appreciated your comments it's like everything else there are many different cooks and there are many different ways to cook a pork chop and for me, everybody has their preference. But I think we really, as you pointed out, need to look at some science instead of what we look in before and afters. We need to be able to compare isolated sclerotherapy to the Clax procedure. We need to look at different types of detergents versus uh, hyperosmolar um, agents. So uh, Dr. Kanata with Clax, what is the ideal patient to treat Clax with? And what is the patient that you would stay away from? Okay, thanks Lowell for your question. It was a great uh, question. My point of view right now is like this. Our, our patients are very, I work in a private clinic or patient decide whatever they want. They know all the techniques already. I have patients who just choose, I would like to have just sclerotherapy. I pay, there are patients that they want to have laser and they are people, people or a patient that just to, what do you think doctor will be the best for me? When I have that choice, I tell them that Clax is a very good choice. They will just release the problem that they have just with three uh, kind of treatment using the Frido, using the laser, and then give the shot of chlorotherapy, and they will be able just to go walk away without bandage. This is the advantage that I see with the clocks. And in my country, because the weather that we have and the hot that we have is, is the best approach for them. What are the ones that will go away with them are the dark skin, people with, who has a very large, higher than two millimeters veins in the back, and also patient who has like a previous treatment in, with a recurrence very often. Those are the patients that I will never go through with the plaques. Thanks, Malai, and I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Uh, I, Dr. Bailey, may I ask one more question? Yes, sir, please do. Um, thank you very much for that informative lecture. I thought it was really good in terms of basic physics and looking at wavelength. And you, you really mentioned all the wavelengths. I think we, my opinion is that we've reached the ultimate I don't think wavelengths matter anymore. What do you think about fibers? Have, have we reached the pinnacle of success with laser and we shouldn't do any more experimentation? We are 
where we are and it's very good? Or should we still investigate? I, I think uh, you are spot on that uh, wavel as far as wavelengths go, we can go to 2000 and it still won't make any difference. And uh, the thing to target is of course, one of them is the fiber. And uh, I've used the radial fiber as most of us have. Uh, I don't know what is your experience, but generally we find, I've used the RFA also. And generally I find that the earlier wavelengths, I've used 810 and 940, they had slightly more pain than RFA. But with the 1940 and 1470, it's almost um, better or as good as RFA. So definitely, you know, um, jacketed uh, fibers, radial fibers, gold tip fibers. So these are the ones that I know about and pro probably you may have used other than the radial fibers also. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. I did publish a study looking at different wavelengths and bare tip fiber versus a jacket fiber. And it was interesting that the jacket fiber, and that's the same thing with a radial fiber, had more influence in terms of better post-operative uh, results than the bare tip and the, and the wavelength. So it was really the, the, the jacket fibers. So when we looked at A10 with a jacket fiber, uh, our, our p-values were, were not statistically significant. So it was very interesting from that fact, but I think we're, uh, we're there in terms of that. In terms of radio frequency, um, I think they're both equal in terms of effectivity, in terms of post-operative recovery. But I think that laser is more versatile. So you can use laser a whole lot different. You can use it. It's easier for perforators, as you know. It's certainly easier for, re for recanalizations. And you can just think about, um, I trust laser because I, with, with, with larger size veins, because you can then adjust your LEDs and your watts and, and your energy. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Male, for letting me comment. And, Doc, and Professor Beatty, thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll just go to two questions quickly here that I see. And I think they have been answered, but uh, one is opinion regarding RFA versus laser for varicose veins. I think that debate is probably almost, you know, taken care of with today's uh, talks. Uh, we have uh, probably uh, gleaned so much more in favor of laser now. Again, back, you know, the pendulum has swung back to lasers. Correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, so that's one, one question and uh, uh, Lowell or uh, Beatty or both can answer that. And then there's one thing, do you elevate the limb during laser and sclero? Is it okay to do microfilbectomy along with sclero and laser? And I, I'd leave that, to, that question to be answered to our Paraguayan team and the... Uh, the, the limb elevation of Malai is an old trick that we use when we do a scleral to empty the vein and have better results. Whenever you do that, you will have better results. If you have a good table that I showed you before, you will be able to use and just put just a little bit down the, the, the head of the patient, tilt just a little bit, and then you will be able to shut everything. But it's uncomfortable. And since you are using, you are cooking the vein, you are using the Fredo, and you are giving the shot of chlorotherapy, I think in, in cracks is enough. Okay, and, and Lowell, uh, how about the debate that still, is it still on RFA versus laser? Is it still a valid debate or has the time come to just finish it off? So as I, I just um, mentioned, uh, just to repeat, I think that the RFA and laser, in my opinion, have the same efficacy uh, and the same post-operative recovery. I think that um, laser is a little bit more versatile in terms of being able to use it in more in different cases. For example, perforators, I think it's easier. For recanalizations, I think it's easier to do and for larger veins, I, I trust it more. But I'm sure there's other opinions out there that would disagree with me, but I think that um, that's usually the universal accepted experience. Thank you for the ability to comment. 
we've got Dr. Morrison here. Dr. Morrison, uh, if you uh, are listening, uh, if you can hear me, uh, Nick, can you can you make any comment that you'd like to make? Or uh... yeah, with with respect to laser versus RF, there isn't any difference. Um, uh, use whatever you're most comfortable with, and uh, and whatever's the least expensive method to use. They, they both work equally well. I tend to use more RF than I do laser, uh, but there's no, there's no question for perforators, laser is a whole lot easier than an RF. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for that comment. So I think we've now reached the stage where both are, have almost reached an equipoise. So let's, let's leave it there. Um, uh, can Stella or Heidi, do you want to say anything about the cosmetic uh, outcomes of the the plaques or just the straight because you may be having more um, patients of that sort who come for cosmetics. So Stella or uh, Heidi, have we, we just wait for your comments and, and then we can start wrapping it up. Hey, I have a question. Um, one question for it. Uh, for the Dr. Ganata, is a procedure required sophisticated equipment and time? Uh, how many uh, long dose procedure for each patient? Cada vez. How many okay. sessions? Cada cuanto le okay. haces? How, uh, the, the, there are two questions. The first one, how often, how much I, is expensive? I, we are talk, we're not talking about science and everything. We are not talking about conflict of interest. We are not, we are thinking about when we are deciding to buy a laser, buy a new machine, it's like just changing your wife. You are decided already and you want to get a new one. Doesn't matter about it. And the point is uh, that you have to realize that if you want to do the best, you might, to, you have to have the best. And this is the idea. The second one regarding about uh, how often I do treatment in plaques once in a week, and then I follow through what are the results. I check with the vein viewer, I check with the visual effect, how is the difference, and also I compare the pictures that before and after. If I need just to just give a little bit, I just wait one more week, and then the second chance, the second shot of, of laser I do for the patient. I thought uh, this is the the answer. Do you want some another question? I don't know. Alguna otra pregunta que tengas, Heidi? Cada cuánto? Cada siete días es la evaluación y cada quince si necesito hacer de un segundo tratamiento. Every fifteen days and every seven days I check the patient. Eh, promedio de sesiones. After the third session, 80% is already out. It's uh, 80% de mejoría after, después de la tercera sesión. Okay, I guess. Thank you. So, I, I see that uh, we can now hand it over to Roy Vargas and uh, is going to just uh, wrap it up by thanking our sponsors. So if there are no more points for discussion, we go straight to Roy Vargas. Roy, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank yeah, you, Malay. Yeah. And I sincerely thank, one by one, I cannot say, I sincerely thank all the big professors of the phlebology world of being here Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Thank you all of you for being with us. I can never forget Servier, the company, which has been sponsoring the meetings for us. And uh, we have no disclosures with them. They are a very reputable company. And I, as the president of the Venus Association of India, once again thank our sponsors and all the participants here. The lectures are available on the net on the YouTube shortly. And if you people have any questions, please continue to ask. We will continue to ask our speakers 
and try to get the answers. Thank you so much, all of you. Have Thank a good you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.